announcement is just a signal to parents that we're trying to be on their side and put a few bucks in their pockets to help them with the impacts of the adverse uh, reality. If you have children in a Toronto or York Region school, this is what you'll likely be facing next week. Next Monday and Tuesday could see hundreds of thousands of students out of class. Three major teachers' unions plan to strike, shutting down schools in the GTA. Today, the education minister was offering cash to parents to help ease the walkout's impact. Lorinda Redekop now with the latest. Today, it was high school teachers from 16 different school boards out on strike, including in Durham. The union confirmed Toronto high schools will be affected next Tuesday. English Catholic teachers, high school and elementary, will also walk off the job. One day earlier, next Monday, TDSB elementary schools will be affected by that union's first one-day strike. We're all on the same page with this. We need the cuts to be removed. While the Minister of Education points the finger of blame at everybody but himself, it's clear that the common denominator here is the Ford education agenda. Children and youth. The education minister denied that. I think there is a pathway to get a deal. Um, I think it requires, though, the teachers' unions to uh, be willing to look at their original proposal uh, and make some moves. They have made none. The province also announced money to help parents who may have to find emergency child care with a strike. Here's a look at how much the government would compensate them. The maximum $60 is for children six and under, not yet in school, but who attend a school-based child care centre required to close. It's $40 for junior and senior kindergarten students, $25 for grades 1 to 7, and $40 for special needs students up to grade 12 or age 21 and under. How appalling that is. How insulting to parents in this province that he's trying to transparently bribe them for support. The ministry says paying parents will cost them up to $48 million a day. That's less than the $60 million the province pays out to teachers. I think the compensation is not the priority. I think the, uh, they come to an agreement. I think that is more important. I agree wholeheartedly with the teachers. They know what they're standing up for. This school has a daycare inside it. The Toronto District School Board tells me that all child care centres located inside schools will be permitted to stay open in the event of a strike. But parents should check first. Now, in terms of negotiations, the unions for elementary, high school and Catholic teachers all tell me they have no talks planned with the province. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. All right, to help you make sense of all the latest developments in the labor situation in our schools, let's get some insight from our Queen's Park reporter, Mike Crawley. Mike, what's the significance of these three big teachers' unions all holding strike days next week? Uh, well, Dwight, first of all, it is simply the sheer numbers of students who are affected. Uh, if all of the planned strikes happen on Monday and Tuesday, uh, between those two days, my math says there's going to be nearly a million kids who lose a day of school. Uh, also, this is going to be the first time in nearly two decades that the Catholic system has been shut down uh, from a strike. And with the elementary teachers union striking for the first time this round, uh, that means classes cancelled for elementary students and the impact there is uh, all kinds of parents scrambling to try to make childcare arrangements. We heard in Lorenda's story about how the Ford government is offering money to parents of young children when schools are closed because of the strike. Explain the strategy there. Well, Dwight, this is clearly a move to try to persuade parents that the government is on their side. It's all part of the battle for public opinion. Yet, it's not really clear exactly what the effect is going to be. So for parents who are currently sympathetic to the teachers, it's hard to see that this would necessarily tip them over into sympathizing with the government. Uh, but for people who voted for the progressive conservatives, you could see how this would fit with Doug Ford's brand of putting money back in the taxpayer's pocket. And already today, 12,000 people have applied for this uh, funding uh, ahead of time. Uh, but though, keep in mind, there's going to be more than a million children who would be eligible for these payments. 
Mike, is it too early for the government to legislate a stop to these strikes? Well, Dwight, usually to justify back to work legislation, uh, the school year would have to be in jeopardy. And that's not the case yet with these rotating one day strikes. Uh, Stephen Lecce, the education minister, says right now the government is simply not focused on legislating an end to the labor disputes do believe that there still is a pathway to get a deal and I mean that may seem a bit improbable given what you're observing in the public discourse but there still is a pathway there and I think parents deserve that all the parties are going to stay at the table and get a deal. Now Stephen Lecce says uh, he uh, will listen to families and find out from them what impact the strikes have uh, but for now he says the focus is on getting deals through bargaining rather than legislating teachers back to work. Dwight? Mike Crawley joining us from Queen's Park tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. There's a lot of dates to remember if you are a parent. We have it all laid out for you online. Just head to cbc.ca slash Toronto. My friend was the first, uh, first suicide, so the one last year in March. And then the, the protest was the next day. In the wake of recent suicides on campus, the University of Toronto reveals its action plan to improve mental health services for its students. I'm Ali Shiasong. Coming up, we will give you a rundown of the recommendations and get student reaction. It's been one week since 57 Canadians lost their lives in the downing of Flight 752 in Tehran. Families continue to mourn the victims while officials continue to investigate how this could have happened. Here in Toronto, a memorial at Mel Lastman Square continues to grow. Shannon Martin joins us live from there now. And Shannon, what kind of messages are people leaving there? Well, Dwight, this really has become a place in our city where people gather, they come here to be together, to mourn, to show support. And what you can see is just a ton of flowers and candles. There's poetry, even Persian desserts. The messages are, you know, equal parts raw, emotional, and devastating. Usually I come here every, every other day. She was my best friend. The day after flight PS752 was shot down, Rahele Fazilat brought this photo. Now worn by the weather, still the smile of her best friend, Shada Shadku, shines on. It was around 12 years ago when we immigrated to Canada. Yeah, we just started to be friends together and till last Wednesday. Talking with her one hour before her flight and uh, I, I told her that I'm, I'm waiting for you. Her story is one of the dozens on display from a tiny pair of Minnie Mouse shoes to handwritten messages all sharing a collective heartbreak. In Farsi, someone writes to GTA mom, Faiza Falsafi, and her two children, Dorsa and Daniel, the entire sky is grieving. On a candle long burned out, a message is written to Arad Zarai. The 18-year-old should have been starting his last semester at Richmond Green Secondary School. Me personally, I cannot still believe it. Sahar comes every day to take photos. She's asked us to protect her identity out of fears for her entire family back in Iran. We are combination, uh, uh, all of Iranian feeling. It's like combination of fear and anger. We are so angry about these things. I just ask Canada and other country to help us to clear what happened exactly with fact. A hope for answers one day from the Iranian government. For now, this outpouring of support brings some comfort. And Dwight, just talking to people as they come here, asking them, you know, what do vigils like this and memorials like this mean to them? And for some, it is comfort. But as you heard in the piece, there is a lot of anger here, confusion. So coming here gives people an outlet for that, a sense as well of community. Coming up a little later on in the show, we'll take you to the University of Toronto and we'll see how that community is trying to bring some good out of this tragedy.
Dwight. We will check back with you. Thank you, Shannon. Transport Minister Mark Garneau says Canada is seeking official status in Iran's investigation into the downing of the Ukrainian plane while continuing to support families and friends of the victims. The government of Canada is sparing no effort to support the victims' families. Our focus at this time remains closure, accountability, transparency and justice, including compensation for the families of the loved ones of the victims. He says TSB investigators on the ground are getting good cooperation, but formalizing Canada's role in the probe would allow them access to the black boxes. Out of the 176 people killed last Wednesday, 138 were on their way to Canada. Canada will waive and reimburse visa and immigration-related fees for those affected by the tragedy. The OPP says it has tracked down two drivers involved in a highway collision we showed you last night where a truck was caught dragging a car along the 401. It happened two days ago near Bayview. This viral video Instagram shows a truck pushing a car sideways along the 401. Police say luckily no one was injured, but the driver of the car is still shaken. I just got off the phone with the driver of that car, a male, 40-year-old man from Scarborough, uh, who was uh, certainly caught by surprise when uh, the vehicle started coming into his lane, uh, hitting him and turning him sideways, pushing him into the shoulder. Uh, he was terrified, uh, honking his horn, yelling at the top of his lungs, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, get some assistance. Police also got a hold of the two people in the truck. Now, they claim they had no idea what was happening. The investigation continues. No charges have been laid yet. Simplifying the process, that's what a task force is recommending for the University of Toronto when it comes to how it delivers mental health services to students. Its final report comes after at least three students died by suicide on campus. Alicia San has the details. My friend was the first, uh, first suicide, so the one last year in March. Um, and then the, the protest was the next day. Okay, go! U of T students have rallied after each suicide that has happened over the last few months, desperately calling for better mental health supports or at least an acknowledgement of a mental health crisis. Because what is the reality of, of the stress that is studying here? I think it comes a lot with the name. University of Toronto, you know, it's known as the best school in Canada. But I think it's, the pressure is a lot different than what people realize. That and not knowing where to turn can be really isolating. I know when I was coming into school, um, I didn't know there was any kind of health and wellness centre. I didn't know there was um, uh, accommodations for mental health. For those who did seek help, they were met with long wait lists, both to see counsellors in person and waiting in the queue on a crisis hotline. It's definitely a known problem that we're all uh, experiencing and I think that the conversation certainly needs to be had. However, um, I just don't know who we can ask to be accountable for, you know, helping us out with these issues. So some of the students that we spoke with today said they are hopeful uh, now that the university has an action plan here, but they also told us that they would like to see some more accountability. As the university's provost, what do you say to the students about the lessons learned here? Uh, I think the most important thing to get out to students is that we are listening to you. On the basis of that, we're developing this new partnership with CAMH. And with that partnership, we're going to revamp our services and improve the care that we provide. In the last six months, U of T conducted a review of its mental health policies. And after consultations with both professionals and students, they came up with 21 recommendations. Some of the priorities are a new partnership with uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health that will allow us to enhance training, uh, improve pathways to service, providing the best care for our students based on their level of need. Are you hopeful that things will get better here? I am. I, I, I'd like to always stay hopeful, you know. Um, Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. If you need to talk to someone, you can call Crisis Services Canada. That's at 1-833-456-4566 or text 45645. A world-leading Toronto doctor has marked a major surgical milestone. The surgeon has performed over a thousand operations on a mysterious pain condition, a condition so bad, patients say it feels like a thunderbolt striking the face. 
and not many doctors know how to treat it. Nick Bovair has more. It's the kind of innocuous task that most of us would never think twice about. But just a few years ago, even this could have been debilitating. Basically an excruciating pain that is almost indescribable that hits one side of your face and sends these almost like an electronic shock. For Marine Shaughnessy Kitts, the inexplicable sensation could come on while brushing her teeth. Sometimes a mild breeze would set it off. On a scale of 1 to 10, she said the pain was a 13. What has suddenly gone wrong with my mind that I'm experiencing this pain and it is just so bad? And then through a miracle of neurosurgery, I am who I am today, totally pain free. Shaughnessy Kitts was diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia, or TN, a rare condition so painful it's sometimes called the suicide disease. It's triggered when a nerve deep in the brain gets compromised and starts sending faulty pain signals. Only a handful of Canadian surgeons know how to deal with it. Using a microscope, we go right to the nerve and get this blood vessel out of the way and thereby eliminate the contact between the vessel and the nerve. So our working distance... Dr. Mojgan Hodai operated on Shaughnessy Kitts in 2017. She completed her 1,000th TN surgery last month. It's one of the very few pain syndromes that we're actually able to achieve pain freedom. People from around the world visit Dr. Hodai here at Toronto Western Hospital. And these days, she's doing more than just surgeries. Her team is developing new imaging tools to capture how pain affects the brain. We are working strongly to figure out why does this pain happen in the first place? Why is it that our brain is able to perceive pain that is so strong? With that knowledge, doctors could better understand and diagnose mysterious conditions like TN. There you go. Perhaps giving hope to other suffering patients. I am feeling so terrific and so thankful and so grateful for the experience that I received. Nick Boisvert, CBC News, Toronto. Call it, it's January in Toronto. We've had mm. lots of rain. Mm -hmm. Where's the snow? <laughs> it's, there's some coming. There's some coming tonight, Dwight, and then there's going to be some more coming this weekend. So finally, winter's going to be making an appearance. So it's light stuff for the most part that will get overnight tonight, so not too significant. Still, you'll want to have a little extra time in the morning for some spots that'll be a little wet and also just to get your car brushed off. The temperature is going to drop. It really is. And uh, this weekend, the next system that moves in, that'll be a more significant amount of snow in terms of the accumulations but the temperatures continuing to rise today are daytime highs they've been continuing to rise at about five to six degrees above seasonal now they're starting to come down but we're at three we were almost up to four degrees earlier this afternoon so still mild out there some of that lighter flurry activity to the north and to the west that's going to make its way down into the gta with milder temperatures though to the south you see it's some rain showers so closer to the lake i think it's going to be a little bit of a mix that you'll be seeing kind of slushy there's not a lot here two to five centimeters to the north and west but for the city of trace to maybe a centimeter or two because of that mix now very strong winds come in tomorrow so snow squalls will develop just know that if you're traveling those northwesterly winds are also going to drop our temperatures tomorrow afternoon and also give us a significant wind chill so it's going to feel like winter by tomorrow afternoon too dwight thanks Colette. you're welcome Convicted Maple Leaf Garden sex offender Gordon Stuckless is now out on day parole. Stuckless's lawyer confirming to CBC News that the 70-year-old was released in mid-December to live at a Hamilton halfway house. Stuckless pleaded guilty in 1997 to sex assaults on 24 boys while he worked as an equipment manager at Maple Leaf Gardens between 1969 and 1988. His lawyer says Stuckless has been chemically castrated over the last 20 years and is of little to no risk to reoffend. Toronto police have made an arrest in a murder that took place late last year. 26-year-old Koshin Youssef was gunned down on December 29th. Youssef was approached by two people near McCown and Eglinton. He was shot and died at the scene. Police say a search warrant earlier today led to the arrest of a man and the seizure of a handgun. 21-year-old Ode Bazuhair from Toronto is now facing a first-degree murder charge. After the break, a big name throws his name into the conservative leadership race. Plus, we're one step closer to Donald Trump's impeachment trial.
the emphasis is making the strongest possible case to protect and defend our Constitution. For the eyes have it, the journal stands approved. The House voted today to send impeachment charges to the Senate. We'll take you to Washington, coming up next. The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Peter McKay says he's in. The former conservative cabinet minister has officially joined the contest to replace Andrew Scheer as party leader. McKay posted the announcement today to his social media accounts. It ends weeks of speculation about whether he would run. McKay was the leader of the old progressive conservative party when it merged with the Canadian Alliance in 2003. He was appointed to several senior cabinet posts by his new boss, then conservative leader Stephen Harper. The U.S. and China have signed phase one of a new trade deal. It's designed to reopen talks between the two countries. At a White House ceremony today, Donald Trump said he's fulfilling a campaign promise he made more than three years ago. And I actually think I more than kept my promise. Now our efforts have yielded a transformative deal that will bring tremendous benefits to both countries. We have a great relationship with China. We have a great relationship with the leadership of China, and China fully understands that there has to be a certain reciprocity. 
Few details of the arrangement have been made public, though, but Trump says China will increase its purchase of American goods by billions of dollars. He also says it will crack down on the pirating of intellectual property and the manufacturing of illegal opiates. The impeachment trial of Donald Trump is now ready to begin. This after Democrats in the House of Representatives took two big procedural steps forward today, first voting to send the articles of impeachment onto the Senate and then naming their prosecutors. It comes as new evidence to support their case is released. Katie Simpson has more. The Democrats have assembled their team of lawmakers, seven members of Congress who will carry out the prosecution of President Donald Trump, which means the impeachment trial in the Senate will begin soon. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's team of impeachment managers includes Adam Schiff, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, who handled much of the impeachment hearing process, and Jerry Nadler, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, who helped draft the articles of impeachment. Most of the seven have real-world experience with the legal system, and for Pelosi, that was no mistake. The emphasis is on litigators. The emphasis is on comfort level in the courtroom. The emphasis is making the strongest possible case to protect and defend our Constitution, to seek the truth for the American people. The trial will begin on Tuesday, but the format isn't set in stone. The Democrats want to call additional witnesses and bring in new evidence, something the Republicans will not commit to and the White House opposes. That push is driven largely in part by the willingness of John Bolton to testify. As Donald Trump's former national security advisor, he has firsthand knowledge of what happened. And in the past 24 hours, new documents have been made public. Notes, emails and text messages from an associate of Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, that seem to connect Donald Trump even closer to the troubles with Ukraine. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. It's been one week since the plane crash in Iran. I'm Shannon Martin, live at the memorial at Mel Lastman Square. Coming up, we'll tell you how one Toronto university is finding a way to honor some of the victims. Stay with us.
It's been one week since the plane crash in Iran. 176 people were on board the flight. When it was downed, 57 of them were Canadian, many in the academic community here. Let's head back up to Shannon Martin, who's at the memorial at Mel Lastman Square. And Shannon, there was a moment, at sil moment of silence rather at many Canadian universities today. That's right. So thousands of students across the country today pausing their studies, standing together in silence to remember. Our cameras were there at the University of Toronto and it's being deeply felt there. Eight people from the U of T community were on that flight, including six students. We talked to a first year student and also a U of T staff member about what life has been like on campus this last week. I definitely think it's been very gloomy, um, to put it, for, for a lack of words. Um, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to kind of move on, especially within the next coming weeks. Um, but I think the best thing we can do is just show our support. It has had ripple effect on all of us because we can relate to these uh, folks so closely in many ways. Uh, they were our colleagues, they were our students, and um, they were in many ways like ourselves, like myself who came here to, Can to Canada with that view to um, get a quality education and to make an impact on society, and many of these folks were exactly that. So uh, I think that has amplified the grief. And so now this the school has announced this new memorial fund in honor of those young lives lost. For the first quarter million dollars, the U of T will match donations three to one. After that, it will be dollar for dollar. The scholarship will be available to international students from Iran or students from any background that want to pursue Iranian studies. Dwight, the school said this is really, you know, their way to try to remember those students, those bright young minds that they lost. Yeah, we lost a lot of them. Thank you for that, Shannon. Iran's top diplomat acknowledges that Iranians were not told the truth for days after its military shot down the Ukrainian passenger plane by mistake. Last few nights, we've had people in the streets of Tehran demonstrating against the fact that they were lied to for a couple of days. People make mistakes, unforgivable mistakes, but it happened in the time of a crisis. Foreign Minister Javad Zarif was speaking at a summit in India. The regime initially said the plane crashed due to a mechanical error, but later admitted to accidentally shooting it down. Zarif says he and the Iranian president only learned about what really happened two days later. Exactly a week ago, flight PS752 was struck by missiles shortly after it took off from Tehran's international airport. Russia's prime minister and his entire cabinet unexpectedly resigned today, a move that helps President Vladimir Putin implement a new plan to reshape power. Dmitry Medvedev announced his resignation on state TV with Putin, Putin rather at his side. Just hours earlier, Putin told Russia's political elite he wants to change the constitution to shift power away from the presidency and give it to the Russian parliament. Now, critics say it's really an attempt to limit the power of his successor and allow Putin to rule in a new capacity after his presidency ends in 2024. Tens of thousands of people have been forced to flee in the Philippines after a volcanic eruption just south of the capital, Manila. The Tiol volcano erupted Sunday with a massive explosion that shot rocks and ash and steam high into the sky. No deaths have been reported, but more than 50,000 people are in emergency shelters. The eruption blanketed Manila with ash, closing schools and government offices. It also temporarily shut down the airport. Tial is one of the most active and dangerous volcanoes in the world. Officials warn another half a million people will be at risk if there is another major eruption. The latest data shows the Earth's climate continues to heat up. The World Meteorological Organization says 2019 was the second hottest year since records began. It showed that the average global temperature in 2019 was 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The WMO says the increasing temperatures will likely lead to more extreme weather events in 2020 and beyond. The hottest year on record was 2016. And we keep talking about this, Colette. We are setting records over and over every year. 
We absolutely are, Dwight, and we take that kind of global information over a broad period of time, like the decade, but let's just talk about locally, and let's just talk about what's going on since we've been into this new year of 2020. 15 daytime highs have been above seasonal. Well, wait a minute. It's the 15th of January. There's only been 15 days, so yes, every day our daytime high. It doesn't matter if it came in the afternoon or where it came in the 24-hour period, but it was above seasonal. Our coldest temperature yet, minus 11.7. That was back on the 9th. We're going to be going colder than that very soon. And our warmest temperature, remember that one? I think you probably do, almost 12 degrees, and that was on the 11th. And just to kind of put things further in perspective, for today, our average high would be minus 2.2, and a low on average would be around minus 10. Today's high 3.9 and our low we haven't quite gotten there so that's unofficial because we'll probably fall a little below that as we head towards midnight tonight but those temperatures still holding in the mild area with that three degrees and that's why as the system comes in it's winter time but we're seeing some showers on our radar there some of that into southwestern Ontario kind of a mix of sort of wet flurries with some drizzle towards the lake shore so probably only a trace of accumulation overnight tonight elsewhere we'll be looking at two to five centimeters that five closer up towards say Barrie or to the northwest of the city and then tomorrow we're going to find really strong winds from the northwest because of that some squalls will likely set up so there are some snow squall watches stretching from Sarnia through London up towards Barrie if you're going to be traveling or you're watching from those communities do keep that information in mind Friday we get a breather not in terms of the temperature that cold air that core is going to be here but then Saturday the temperature actually comes up with this next system at times we could see a bit of a mix that will have an impact on our accumulations but it is looking like we will likely see 10 to 15 centimeters or so through the day Saturday and then some flurries coming in behind that into Sunday your temperatures overnight tonight not bad well above seasonal, almost 10 degrees above seasonal but tomorrow they'll be falling into the afternoon with that northwesterly wind it's going to feel like about minus 12 by tomorrow afternoon and the temperature goes to minus 14 feeling like minus 20 Thursday Thursday night into Friday. So we're uh, we're about to experience some colder temperatures than we've seen so far in 2020, Dwight. It is Canada and it is January. <laughs> Thank oh, you, I, God, we got to be reminded sometimes, <laughs> yes, we right? Do. Thank you. Efforts are heating up right across the country to tackle the issue of disposable cups. Some independent cafes are finding their own solutions, but as Jacqueline Hansen explains, fast food chains are having a harder time changing their ways. I pretty much always have it in my backpack. Yeah. Brenda Green was stunned when McDonald's refused to fill her reusable mug. They told me that it was a contamination issue, and I just thought that that was so ridiculous. Green and her colleague went back to capture it on camera and posted the video online in hopes some bad publicity would force McDonald's to change its policy. They're such a large corporation. How dare they make it so difficult to make such a small, small impact? Plastic lined disposable cups have generated concern because most Canadian recycling programs don't accept them. It seems simple, but the cup is, is really challenging. McDonald's and others have invested in a competition to find a greener cup. Almost a year ago, 12 winners were selected. It needed to meet certain performance criteria. It has to hold hot and cold liquids. Um, it has to meet certain environmental criteria in terms of sourcing. And it needs to be recoverable in recycling or composting systems. Prototypes are being tested and may be ready for market later this year. But some environmentalists say reusable cups are still better for the environment. Shifting to something that's compostable or made of another material is just shifting our disposable problem from one type of material to another. It's not actually solving it. Many coffee shops, including Starbucks and Tim Hortons, already accept reusable mugs and offer customers a small discount if they use them. But Tim Hortons says few people do it. With low single digits, it's in, it's in line, to be quite frankly, with, with the industry. Um, so it's not where we want it to be. This year, the company plans to give out millions of reusable cups for free and introduce new ways to reward people for using them. If anyone's going to be able to change guest behavior in terms of going with reusable cups and taking a more sustainable angle, it's going to be us. As for McDonald's, it is now bowing to public pressure. Today, it tells us it is changing its policy. All of its restaurants across the country will allow reusable mugs by the end of February. A small win for the environmentally conscious, but only a win for the environment if customers take them up on the option. 
Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. After the break, Canadian Tire gets into the electric car game. This allows EV owners to drive coast to coast and do it as quickly and as easily as they could have in a gas car. Making it easier to make the switch. I'm Natalie Collada with new charging stations popping up across the country, province and right in the city of Toronto. We'll have that story for you coming up. They make up less than 1% of vehicles in Toronto, but new electric charging stations are on the way in this province and across the country. All of it courtesy of private companies. Despite a drop in EV sales in Ontario, advocates are calling the new infrastructure necessary. Nali Kalada explains. So, I mean, it's freedom. It's why, why we're drawn to cars to start with. Wilf Stimple can't wait to hit the road. This allows EV owners to drive coast to coast and do it as quickly and as easily as they could have in a gas car. Launched today, a network of Canadian tire charging stations, many in Ontario, that would allow electric vehicle drivers to go from Charlottetown to Nanaimo without worry. We will be installing 240 EV fast charging stations and 55 level 2 charging stations at 90 locations across Canada. According to Electric Mobility Canada, last year sales of e-vehicles rose 25% in Canada, but it's a different story in Ontario. Here, sales plummeted more than 50% last year when the new provincial government cancelled a rebate program, with buyers no longer getting up to $14,000 back. Still, advocates are hopeful. And of course rebates help, but we know in the long run we are going to see growth in EV sales and we know uh, Bloomberg is telling us and other analysts are telling us that by 2024-25 we're going to hit price parity, which means the equivalent gas car will be the same price as an equivalent EV and, and then you know all bets are off. Seeing charging stations, advocates say, signals what's around the corner. Because most of the charging stations up until now have been like in underground parks parking lots and behind buildings, you didn't see them. So people say, well, I'd love to get an EV, but I didn't, I don't see any chargers anyway. These are really visible. And the industry says they have to be ready. Part of that important part of the equation is making sure we have the infrastructure there to support right. it and that people have the confidence that they can drive that car wherever they normally drive their vehicle. All of it driving towards an ambitious federal government goal of 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2040. Natalie Collada, CBC News, 
Toronto. Coming up next, getting more black students interested in a career in law. Never count yourself out, never discount your experiences. Know that everything you carry with you, the background, the experiences, everything you've learned thus far is valuable and you can definitely apply and you can definitely make it and you can definitely be here. Welcome to your Toronto Newsroom. Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. After the U of T Medical School found success attracting more black students with a focused application stream, the Black Future Lawyers program now aims to do the same for the law school. There is a big kickoff on campus tonight. Earlier today, I spoke with a U of T law grad about her journey and also about how a program like this will help. So like many law students who end up here at the Faculty of Law, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I chose it when I was around nine years old. That young. Uh, yes. And I had no idea what a lawyer did. I didn't know any lawyers in our immediate circle. My parents were not lawyers. So I'm not too sure where the idea came from, but I was very uh, certain that that's where I wanted to end up. Any barriers as you went on this journey? Maybe not around nine, but after in high school on your way to university, what kind of barriers did you face? Uh, coming from a working class immigrant family, I'm the first in my family to earn a university degree. So that in itself came with a lot of uh, barriers and challenges. Yes. You don't necessarily have a template to work off of when you're from that sort of background. Um, you don't have a lot of role models and examples of people who are professionals and as well as a lot of uh, class barriers having to do with uh, maintaining a part-time job while you are doing your undergraduate studies while also ensuring that your grades are competitive enough mm -hmm. to get into law school and that was sort of what I had to focus on and even with the whole uh, law school admissions test preparation a lot of courses are very costly and it makes it all the more difficult for those who are interested to get into law school to actually get in. How will then the Future Black Lawyers program help young people like you looking for a career in law and trying to overcome some of these challenges? 
So what we aim to do with the Black Future Lawyers Program was to ensure that all black applicants who apply under this application stream would have their voices heard and they would have all their application read and they would have three reviewers at the faculty looking through their application. They would also have student members of the admissions committee looking at their application as well as members of the black legal professional community looking at their application and that was very important to us because we wanted to build a more diverse and inclusive legal profession. And you guys saw something similar here at U of T with the medical students did the same thing and were kind of following up on that, kind of parroting that. Let's talk about the ultimate goal here. Is the ultimate goal then to see more black students pursue law? Yes, the ultimate goal is to see them attend this law school in particular. Um, we believe that society will definitely benefit from a more diverse legal profession. And Canada is a very multicultural country and Toronto is a very multicultural city. And so by and large it only makes sense that the legal profession reflects that as well. And we saw that the medical school did have great results with their program and we're really hoping for the same uh, results to happen here. Do you feel that there is an honor? representation in there as you're an article and student as you went through law school do you feel that there is enough representation there is quite an underrepresentation in the legal profession in general um, a lot of students might count themselves out a lot of students might think that they're not uh, competitive to get into law school and so what we really tried to do with black future lawyers was ensure that everybody believes that their voice can be heard and that they have a shot at actually you know getting into the law school here at university of toronto if there's a young person watching this and in their mind said, Looks, yeah, I would think about being a lawyer as a profession, what would be your advice to that person to try to get to where you are today? My one piece of advice would be to never count yourself out, to never discount your experiences. Know that everything you carry with you, the background, the experiences, everything you've learned thus far is valuable and you can definitely apply and you can definitely make it and you can definitely be here. I myself, I applied on a whim to this law school and I was accepted so we're hoping for a lot of similar stories through this program. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank you so much. Congrats on your success to this point. Thank you. Megan is dealing with some more family drama, this time her own family. If this case is to be determined, um, Mr. Markle will have to give evidence. Megan's father may testify against her in a court battle with a British tabloid that she says ran a smear campaign against her. We'll have that story for you next.
What defines a city? It's the people. Torontonians are diverse, friendly, fanatical, and adventurous. We are the mirror to this amazing, shining city on the lake. Our Toronto is your Toronto. If you thought the firestorm surrounding Prince Harry and his wife Meghan has been bad over the past two weeks, well, it could soon get even worse. Today, the British media is reporting that Meghan's estranged father is prepared to testify against his daughter in court in a case she instigated against a London tabloid. Renee Filipponi explains. The lead up to this big moment was mired in family drama for Meghan after a public fallout with her father played out in the British press. The growing rift culminated with Thomas Markle handing a personal letter from his daughter to the Mail on Sunday, which published it. During a trip to Africa in October, it was announced Meghan would be taking the paper to court, accusing the tabloid of a smear campaign against her. The paper has now filed its defense, saying there is a huge and legitimate public interest in the royal family and the activities, conduct and standards of behavior of its members. The press need the royal family, the royal family need the press. And I think that is some, and th that involves sometimes things are tough, sometimes they're very smooth. Meghan's father will be a big part of the defense's evidence, including text messages between the pair. And they're also going to argue that Thomas Markle is entitled to have his say. Dubbed Markle versus Markle, the two who haven't seen each other in years could end up face to face in court if the case goes to trial. In these circumstances, the only loser is Meghan and she'd be better to cut her losses right now. This lawyer says the paper uh, has no motivation to settle. Uh, this is going to be a bloodbath if it goes to trial. Uh, Meghan is going to be subjected to forensic cross-examination. She's going to be sliced and diced by one of the best cross-examiners in London. It will be up to the Sussexes to drop the case. If they don't, they could end up in the middle of an unprecedented media circus at a time when the couple are trying to carve out a new and more dialed back lifestyle for their family in Canada. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. The couple is rumored to be heading to British Columbia to live part time, but this might make them reconsider. Much of the West is in a deep freeze right now. Extreme cold alerts are in effect with the wind chill making it feel like minus 50 degrees in some places. Forecasters say people should not expect any relief until the end of the week. On top of the frigid temperatures in BC, another major snowfall is expected for parts of the region today. In Vancouver alone, emergency calls regarding slips and falls more than doubled this week. And my shoulder is feeling it mm. with them. One of our viewers, I think it was Kirsten, she tweeted at us when I asked you earlier, where's the snow collet? And she tweeted at us that it's in BC. Yeah, they've got a, I'm not responsible for that, by the way. <laughs> no, you're not. no, I'm responsible for what's coming here. And we've got a few systems moving through mm -hmm. that will bring us some snow. So we're looking at one of those tonight. It's light stuff, probably a trace, and it's going to be kind of mixed with some wet flurries and showers. So near the lake shore, a trace to a centimeter or two, but a little further towards the north and northwest, two to four, maybe even five centimeters. We'll be seeing the temperature falling by tomorrow afternoon to minus four. It will keep going down from there. So we're going to see strong winds from the northwest tomorrow, very gusty. Winter is going to make its way in, mm -hmm. and it's going to bring us more snow, Dwight, on Saturday. Got a couple of days. Get that shoulder. <laughs> to get it ready on. to shovel. And we have shovels here in B.C. Uh, Victoria, not so much. There was actually online, there's a picture of somebody using a folding chair. What? To clear because <laughs> they have no shovels. Whatever you got, I guess, right? That's it. That's our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Mike Wise has your next local news tonight after the national. For news anytime, download the CBC News app. We will see you back here tomorrow night at 6. Have a great night, everybody.